know I just said the mics are a bit funny. I don't think it's cracking jokes. But, um, Tenakoto, 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 Katu, Ako, Mahesh, Murder, Tokuino, Ingoa, Naomai, Haramai, Ki, Tene, Munu. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for the intro. Welcome. My name is Mahesh Murada. I'm honored to set the scene for a constructive exchange today. We are gathered here to address an issue that is deeply affecting our community. The rising crime rates in our beloved Auckland Central. Over the past few years, we've seen a disturbing increase in criminal activity from thefts and assaults to the tragic gunshot incidents that have claimed lives and shattered families. It has reached a point where crime seems to be some sort of normal occurrence for many of us, and that is completely unacceptable. We should not accept this. We should work hard to maintain our identity as a country where everyone feels safe. Over the last few years, stats have painted a, a, a fairly worrying picture. Reports indicate that more than four in 10 open hospitality businesses have been hit by crime. Businesses fear for their survival, and visitors to our city center are being warned about the rising crime rates. This is not the Auckland we know and love. It is important to note that retail has been disproportionately hit, and through that, the South Asian community, the Korean Indian community, have been hit really hard. I have many families who reach out to me concerned about the safety of their breadwinners. We must acknowledge the efforts of our local leaders who have been working tirelessly to combat the issue. The mayor has spoken out, and Vivek has also spoken out in regards to calling for tougher consequences for crime and increased funding to fight crime for CBD. However, there's much more to be done, and this is why we're here tonight. We need to come together as a community to listen, to discuss, and to address these issues. It's my great pleasure to introduce the Honorable Mark Mitchell, our spokesperson for police, our Minister of Police. Mark has an extensive background in law enforcement and security. He served in the New Zealand Police for 13 years, where he was a member of the dog section and the armed offender squad. Post a successful career in private sec security, he entered Parliament in 2011 and has held various ministerial positions including Minister of Defense, and now Minister of Corrections, Minister for Emergency Management and Recovery, and Minister of Police. Mark's commitment to public safety and his vast experience make him the right person to lead this discussion. We are fortunate to have him here tonight to share his insights and plans for tackling the crime issues we face. Without further ado, please put your hands together to welcome the Honorable Mark. And um, good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out on a uh, Tuesday evening. Um, just a little bit of background. Um, the sort of shared a little bit of my background with you, but um, I just thought I'd say that uh, I love my police and career, um, and I started right here in Auckland City uh, on Section 1 up at the Auckland Central Police Station. And my first two years were spent on the beat um, in the city and working out of Monsby out of the, out of the then Wharf uh, Police Station, which of course we lost. And for me as a young B constable, I took huge pride and ownership um, in the city that we were tasked at looking after, uh, protecting and serving. And we built relationships with the uh, shopkeepers and the retailers. Uh, we gathered intelligence. We knew where the problems were. We took great pride in the fact that we were proactive and we were proactive in, in dealing with those issues. And Auckland was not a perfect city, no city is, but it was a pretty darn safe city, um, and we were proud of that. Fast forward quite a few years, and certainly over the last six, and um, I spent 10 years overseas, and, and my sort of measure that I use personally in terms of how safe the country was is basically how safe the major city was. And although Auckland is not our capital city, it is probably only our truly international city in terms of size and scope. And sadly for us, we cannot say to visitors that visit our beautiful country that you're going to be safe in our CBD after dark. And that is a terrible thing to have to say because in my view, we're a small island nation. We don't share borders with anyone. We have one national uh, police service. We don't have a um, multi-jurisdictional system. We don't have a state or a federal system. 
Um, and there's no reason why we shouldn't be the safest country in the world. But we've all seen in the last six years that we've gone backwards pretty badly in relation to public safety. So I'm going to come to a very shortly to sort of what we're doing and what our plans are, but I do want to make some acknowledgements. Um, Chris Robert, it's great to see that um, that you are here, and I see that we've got some CPNZ patrollers in the room to acknowledge um, the work that you do uh, in supporting our frontline police officers. It is um, hugely important and it is highly valued. Um, Vert, it's good to see you here. I know we've got some councillors in the room as well, um, and we've got some business leaders um, in the room too. Leo, always good to see you. Um, so, what are we doing about this situation? Well, this in incoming government is the Minister of Police. You would have seen that I released my um, letter of expectation to the Commission. And I released that publicly. The reason why I did that is because, and that was the first time that's ever happened. And the reason I did that is because I felt it was very important for us as a country and a community, if you're interested, to see the direction of travel that we want to take. And it's very different, very different to the direction of travel that we've seen in the last six years. And that quite simply was simple things like back to basics policing. Highly visible police, police back on the beat, police back doing what I used to do, developing relationships with your shopkeepers, with your retailers, understanding the community, knowing where the problems lie, and then being able to come up with solutions to deal with them. The police generally get blamed for everything, and the reality is this, is that they don't control what society throws up. They can only deal with what society throws up. And a lot of the issues that we're having to deal with as a community, as you, as residents of the CBD, or shopkeepers, or retailers here in our CBD, you're having to deal with a lot of those societal issues. And they can't be fixed just by police, I assure you of that. It's got to be a genuine partnership. It's got to be a partnership between police, the council, retailers, CPNZ. Um, we all have to be able to identify the areas that we're responsible for, and then have a plan in terms of what we're going to do to address that. And that's a big part of the role that I'm playing as a police minister to so bring our stakeholders together so that we can roll our plan out. I can tell you that in the last six months, there has been a 58% increase in police patrols in our CBD. I can tell you that crime is starting to trend down. Now that doesn't mean that I'm saying that we, that we still haven't got a big problem. We have got a big and we had to get on top of it. But what I am saying, I was talking to Viv about uh, to the car on the way here, is that we're starting to see the trend go in the right direction again. But there's a lot of work to do so that we actually, so that after dark, you as residents can come out and know that you can walk safely around our streets without the fear of being accosted. That you don't have to look at people doing drug deals on the street corners. That you don't have to worry about homeless people um, sleeping on the streets is causing a big problem for us. We have to deal with the emergency of social housing, there's no doubt about that. It's got to be a joined up approach. But what I can tell you from a policing perspective is that we are moving back to basics. You will see an increased presence of police on the streets and you ask them, you will start to see, and I hope you start to feel it, that the trend is starting to move in the right direction, that we are starting to get on top of this, um, this one problem. The other thing that I would say, I was just talking to Sonny, I want to acknowledge Sonny because as you all know, he's been a huge advocate and a very strong voice for our um, dairy owners and, uh, and retailers. And he's been doing that over many years. And so it's a bit of a thankless task, Sonny, but you've, um, you've got enormous energy and, and passion and focus in the work that you're doing. Um, but I was just sharing with him again that violent retail crime in our country is starting to come down. Again, I'm not saying that we've got it, uh, that there's not a lot of work to do, there is. There's still a ton of work to do. Um, but from the policing perspective, in my role as your police minister, I'm working as hard as I can to get our police back focused on their core role. And that means things like um, starting to withdraw from mental health plans. And I know there's been a bit of narrative around that, I know there's been a bit of concern around it, but let me just explain to you where I'm coming from on that. Is that there's been a 60% increase in uh, mental health plans for our police officers. I was on night shift here with, um, with the section about six weeks ago and there was an iCar, an iCar is a, is, a, is a car that has um, two police officers in it, it's called an instant car. 
It was pulled out to a young lady that um, was about 18 or 19 and she was having um, thoughts of self-harm, which is terrible. And we have to look after anyone that's got a mental health um, condition or, or is um, suffering from depression and needs some help and support. But the police had to go and pick her up and take her up to the ED at Auckland Hospital and then sit and look after her for the next eight hours. That is not their job. They are not trained to do that. She needs a proper mental health expert to actually sit with her, to diagnose her, and work out what sort of support and treatment we need to give her to get her back on the road to, um, to, to be healthy. We shouldn't be doing that. There's always going to be some cases that the police will need to attend, but actually the health response is a better response for that. Family harm. We talk about family harm. Family harm now is, is so broad that it includes everything from a violent domestic, where the police must attend. There's a requirement for them to be there. There's a clearly identified offence, there's violence involved, and the police have got a role to play. But the same night that I was out on my shift, um, one of the jobs that came in was a P2 category job. It was a mother and daughter fight, fighting over an iPhone charger. <laughs> And you can't tell me the police need to be standing in their living room trying to resolve that. So the police are getting much better and they're putting a lot of work into making sure that they triage those calls so they clearly identify whether it may be an offence committed and that they have to respond to, or whether or not it can be dealt by another agency. They're effectively doing, and I've felt like this for a long time, is our police are effectively doing the job of four agencies. And it's been too easy in the past to work off to. Because they're an agency, they're a highly motivated agency that looks for solutions, and so they continually go out and look for solutions, continue to pick up more work. I'm trying to get them back on their core role. I'm trying to get them back on the role that when a member of the public puts their hand up to help and they genuinely need a police response, they can get the response. Because Sonny, you would agree that some one of the biggest frustrators with our frustrations with our dairy owners and our retailers is that when they put their hand up for help, Often the police are unable to get there straight away because they haven't prioritised and they haven't to meet all these other demands. So that's a big piece of the work that I'm doing with police and across government. It's to try and free them up and allow them to get back on their full role. Um, look, I'm very conscious of the fact that, um, that this is your time and that we're here to, that I'm here to take questions and, um, and respond to those. I'm conscious that we've got other people in the room that may want to contribute as well. Chris and Robert, um, we welcome you to come up and make a pitch for CPNZ. Um, these guys are always recruiting, and I encourage you to have a think about it. It's a great way to engage, engage in um, public service, and at the moment we need uh, more CPNZ officers out there, the eyes and ears, helping um, support our, our folk on the Look, we, you, you would have all seen we've got a very good program around public safety. We've got a big problem with the gangs here, massive growth in the gangs, carry firearms, they're willing to use them, they're a lot more violent, they've been operating for the last six years in a very permissive environment where they think they can operate with impunity and it's made our frontline police officers job a lot more dangerous and it's made the public, it's put the public at a lot more risk as well. You would have seen in the bit of these boy races. That's not an isolated incident. We see that happening just about on a weekly basis, whether it be in rural Waikato or over in Tauranga, down the South Island, they come out, they terrorise the local community, they go into the rural communities of course, have it there. Um, I'm going to work with Simeon Brown to make sure that we can get some legislation that means that um, if they want to come out, they want to ignore the police, attack the police, terrorise the communities that they live in, they won't lose their vehicle for 90 days, their vehicle's gone. We'll take it. Um, and I think that's going to be a very good deterrent and send a very strong message. So that they're not going to put up with that. There has been a loss of respect for our police officers, there is no doubt about that. And a lot of the work that we're doing, a lot of the powers that we're giving them, is quite simply giving them the ability to get out, back out there and reassert themselves. To allow the public to feel that our police are controlling the streets and not the gangs or these war races or these idiots that think that they're above the law. So look, I'm going to wrap it up there and, um, and go out to any uh, questions or thoughts that you might have.
and um, then look at the blue rock. Anyone else that wants to speak with their colleague, very welcome to do that. Because it is a partnership. What we're doing without a doubt is a partnership. And that is how we're going to achieve my vision, which is for our biggest international city to be the safest city in the world. So we can attract people back into it. People want to live in it. Shopkeepers and retailers can feel safe when they get up in the morning to go to work. And we can attract tourists to come into our environment um, all from the same day. Thank you very much, Mark. We're going to so we're gonna begin the Q&A with um, two questions. First one from Adam Watkinson from the Auckland City Residents Association. They might come a bit there, and then we'll open it up to the entire floor. We will be excluding media, so we'll just be Auckland City um, residents. So no media during the Q&A. Excellent, Adam. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. I'm Adam uh, Parkinson. I'm the um, chair of the City Centre Residents Group. Um, great comments. Thank you for all those. You mentioned quite a few things in there which are completely relevant to what we want to kind of achieve. Yeah. Um, others will talk about some of the issues they're facing in their communities and their specific groups. Um, I guess for residents, we're a pretty robust bunch here. Um, but there's, a, there's certainly a lot of disquiet, not fear, in the, in the residents in uh, the city. Uh, alcohol has always been a big problem for us. We've used alcohol in life farms. Yeah. Uh, and you mentioned the other one around um, the use of vehicles, uh, boy races, um, modified vehicles, all those sorts of things. So it would be great to have some more uh, rigorous, 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 catch it up. Rigorous enforcement around those things. But, I think I want to turn back on what you mentioned around police stations. So you know full well that there were police stations here. There was one up in P Street, there was one in Ford Street, uh, and there was one up in Vincent Street. Um, and it was a great disappointment for residents that those police stations were all closed. And we ended up with a central police station in there at Freeman's Bay, which I'm sure is lovely for the people, the people of Freeman's Bay. Uh, but there's a great sense in, amongst residents here that it would be fantastic to have, in fact, it's uh, urgent and required, a public facing permanent police station back in the city centre. Now, you mentioned that cities throughout the world our size, uh, they have much better, um, perhaps possibly better uh, crime outcomes, but they also all have a police station in the city centre. Uh, there's two aspects to that from our, from our point of view. There's the perception of safety that that provides. But it's also very important that the police are physically present when they need to get pulled out of the city centre. And they can just walk around to have those wonderful patrols that you mentioned. So my question is, when will we see a police station return to the city centre? Yeah, so it's a really good question and I'm very sensitive to the fact that um, the residents would like to see that. In fact, we might actually using the CBD regularly, would like to see that. I agree with you completely. Um, I'm, I'm going to let you know that I have no budget for that at the moment. Uh, but what we are doing, and by the way, that is an operational decision for police. I cannot interfere in it, however. I have made it very clear that I want to see a police presence uh, in terms of patrol base or something. At least the first step in the right direction, especially in downtown London. And so what's happened is that um, uh, Viv came forward with someone that was very kindly got off us and do a part public-private partnership, um, some space here that the police could work with them to set up a patrol base. That property wasn't suitable, but there's another property that's, um, that's become online down in downtown. Um, I've asked the police and I've said, I've said to them, look, please work with um, whatever options come up and see what we can do. <coughs> they actually have a physical presence. In lieu of that, I've asked if there is a physical presence to an increase in the property. So, um, and, and by the way, yes, I agree with you. Um, having a uh, having a police station back in the CBD, there is one, but it's a little bit it's on the fringes. Um, but certainly back in the downtown Auckland would be great. Um, the only thing I'd say to you is that awful tragedy that we saw unfold down in Dunedin uh, with the stand was right across the road from the police station. Um, so what's more important is having a physical presence, is actually having uniformed police officers on the beat, physically present, highly physical, reassurance building out those relationships that, um, that I was talking to. But do I agree with you on principle around having a, a 
another location absolutely having, having been a deep office out operating out of the, the Wharf Police Station or the Central Police Station um, well, I agree with you Thank you the big city um, thank you very much you did cover a number of things off that are important from our perspective uh, we agree it's not just a police matter although we're very keen on the um, police presence and uh, police station but it's also the mental health support separating that from police we've seen through the COVID period how significant that's been significant, significant challenge that's been and also the management of housing making sure that that is well managed with the ground and support the question I've got is that we're a transforming city and we've got some key things ahead, like the city railway. Um, I realise there is a challenge with extra resource, and you've committed the extra 500 police. What I'm keen to understand is how do you, are you able to give us any indication of how that might roll out here? Because as a young person in New York in the 80s, I remember what it was like to go into a, an underground that wasn't safe. So we do need to be thinking now about how do we keep building on it. Everything you're saying is what we can keep here, just how we, with the consideration that we were given to making sure that we are a safe place and, and we don't wait for everything to be right once we get the CRL. So you're right, just funded an additional 500 frontline police officers, so those are all sworn police officers. Um, that again, it's an operational decision for the Commissioner. However, I would, uh, as you know, one of my priorities is returning Auckland, our CBD, back to a safe CBD. Um, and so my expectation is that the resources are put in place to help us achieve that. Like I said, we start to move in the right direction, it's going to take more um, uh, to get it moving faster. So uh, yes, I expect to see more resources coming into Auckland CBD. Brilliant, now we're Yes, sir. Yeah, Thank you very much for coming this evening. We really appreciate it. Uh, my name is Tim Jones and I represent the Body Corporate Chairs Group. Welcome to the mic closer to you. Now, hold the mic closer. Uh, we represent um, apartment buildings in the central city in, in the area. One of the concerns that we have is that a large number of apartments are now um, tenanted by individuals that have been left in apartments through the COVID and the creating problems for the apartment owners and apartment buildings and creating crime and problems in the area. So this is a uh, MSD agency problem that I think uh, is across uh, the whole issue that needs to be looked at by yourself and the <coughs> ministers. Can you comment on that, Lynn, for us? Yes, I can, and I, I agree with you completely. I've experienced it up in my own electorate <coughs> uh, with Follow Parole, where we had um, social housing. It's not always the people that are living in the social housing, it's the people that come and attach themselves. And, um, and the one thing that we have been very clear about is that there's, there's been no sanctions applied to um, people that are creating um, you know, social issues uh, around the uh, around the, around that social housing. So one thing is there's going to be more sanctions applied, um, so the better standards are going to be expected. Um, but I do recognise that, that you know the police tell me that a lot of the issues are sort of emanating out of the emergency housing slash social housing. So. Part of the work that I am doing is I'm pulling together stakeholders, um, council, the mayor, uh, the um, uh, association leads, absolutely. Um, you know, the, the government agencies, Sylvia Brown with local government, um, Chris Bishop with, uh, with KO, so that we can do a joined up approach, identify clearly who everyone, what everyone's responsible for, and then work out a plan to say we have to work together to, to, to continue to um, uh, move in the right direction in terms of making our CBD a much safer place. So, so that is definitely part of what needs to be addressed in the building. Thank you. 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 Well, I'd like to think that um, in six to 12 months, you'll start to notice the change. So the change has happened. There is starting to be a reduction in um, crime in our CBD. But I want you to notice it. And I want you to be able to come out of your home, your apartment, at, um, at six or seven o'clock at night and feel safe to walk to one of the restaurants. Um, I want you to be able to come out and not be worried about um, the vacancy and the rough sleepers and the people that lie down the streets. I want you to be 
be able to come out and not have to deal with and see the drug deals going on um, outside the apartment buildings. Um, you know, that, that's if you, the, the feedback I get from you will tell me whether or not we've been successful and we're getting the right track. Um, but those are the sort of things that I expect to see. Sir. Thank you. Uh, hi, Mark. Let's uh, be here again because uh, when I joined National Party as a member in 2020, I was living in the Oh, you were? Yes. Uh, so I think the first National Party event I was in is in your office. <laughs> so uh, I appreciate all the work you do for us. And I uh, live in uh, Central Oakland now. So my question is I noticed that in China, like 20 years ago, 30 years ago, I was doing all this very high. Uh, recently, uh, the past few years, that's going down and down. A fun major reason is because we have very good camera systems, AI face scan systems, and then actually the criminals, they scared about that because no matter how you cover your face, no matter how fast you are, they know the police will phone them very soon. So do we have any plan, like, especially in the city, do we have any plan to add or set up more like camera or those kind of systems for AI or like face scan, those kind of things? To scare or to, to make this police system more effective? Yeah. Do you have any plan like that? So, so a, lot of the, a lot of the CCTV networks and things that you see are local government led or um, business associations. Uh, you know, but, but we recognize that technology has got a big part to play without a doubt for our public safety. And I know that at the moment, um, Foodstuffs is running a trial around facial recognition. And, um, and it's been very successful. I went and visited one of their stores actually at Light Patch um, a few weeks ago. And uh, they have had a big decrease in, in verbal and, uh, and physical assaults on their staff um, because of the facial recognition uh, program that they're running. So I'm a huge supporter of that. Um, when they finish the trial, there will probably be a bit of debate in this country as to whether or not we can roll that out further, but I think we should. Um, because you know, technology has got a big part to play um, in making sure that we can make someone's workplace safer for your community or your street safer. Yeah. Good evening. I'm a JSP visitor. Good evening. City mission will be there, and, and that's feedback that I can provide. Um, absolutely. So, is the city mission here? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, there, there's, some, there's some direct feedback there. Recognising that the people that you're dealing with are high needs and, and complex and the rest of it, but you know, again, partnering with the police, we are there to support and we're there to make sure to deal with the issues that, um, that do crop up. It sounds to me like um, the drug dealing is, is a, is a, um, is a problem. It's a smash it's drug dealing. What is it? The it's, it's violence, it's drug dealing. It's, um, is it, it's is it that, I don't want to put you on the spot, but is that how you these? Well, I'm not sure what I said before. What I can assure you is that we're going to be able to do this. Here's the mic. Good evening, everyone. My name is Helen Robinson. I'm here with the commissioner. Uh, lovely to be here with you. Yes, Thank absolutely. you, Mark. Uh, I think what I can say is that we will, of course, work very closely with the police and do, and in fact, this is an opportunity for me to say thank you for the police force that do incredible work uh, across the city in all kinds of different forums, both at home around the end of East Day Street. I'm conscious that there are people in this room who feel quite differently about Day Street, and in our experience, I want to acknowledge that uh, this is not news for me or for us. Uh, so we'll just keep hearing, keep doing our best to listen and to work through with you. And 
Thank you. Can't ask any more than that. But, um, but and, and that is a good conversation to have, and that is good that these issues are being raised because um, we support the city mission as well. They do outstanding work, without a doubt. Um, but we have to make sure the residents feel that they're safe, and many of the issues that are emanating out of there that we deal with. And um, because ultimately, um, we're not going to fix the city um, unless we're all working together. Right? Well, we're not. We actually have to come together. It's not just one agency, it's not one group, it's not the police. It's actually us, all of us collectively, um, taking ownership of it. So we're going to work together to, uh, to fix these issues. Sir? I want to speak loudly. Um, last week, I don't know, sort of Michael Moore was commenting on the behaviour of police in New Zealand. He said, frankly, they're useless. They're more useless than the United Nations. And I'll, I'll say for the last three years I've had my friends around the country say the same thing. And you talk about community working together. The community's got one arm tied behind the back on every issue. Whereas the police don't. We don't see them turn up. To us it's not about you the minister, it's not about funding. To us it's about the laziness of the police. It's almost like an obstacle to turn up to something and there always seems to be an excuse. It's also the politicising where they do turn up, like one of Mahesh's meetings, to report two stolen e-bikes at a political rally. Why? What relevance has that got? That's a politicised move to make it look like they're doing something in our community. So, my question to you is, if the police are being lazy, or the perception of the public is that the police are lazy and not actually doing what they're endorsed to do, will you act upon it, even if it means you're unpopular with the very ministry that you're in charge of? Here, here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> point used to be unpopular. That's, that's, that's not a concern. But I would say that by listening to what you're saying, the police, um, look, I'm, I'm a huge um, believer in environmental police services, no doubt about that. I'll be the first one to call them out if I think they're not doing something right or they're not being professional in their behaviour. But ultimately, we've got a world class police service. They have been operating under a very difficult and constrained environment for six years, and we're trying to untie their back, their hands are behind their back, to give them the powers to allow them to go out and reassert themselves. Because what's happened is, what you've seen, is that they get, the public have watched for a long time the gangs taking over our streets, right? Intimidating and, and, um, and you know, abusing members of the public, and the police standing by their phones, videoing that. That's not acceptable. Um, we changed all of that. In the last six months, I've been very proud of the way the police have responded. They're now putting the proper resources in. They're policing the gangs hard. They've just been down the Hawks Bay with you know, over a thousand gang members turned up down there. The feedback that I've had from the mayors and the public has been nothing but positive. The police are highly visible. They're taking action. They're protecting the rights of law abiding citizens over and above those that break the law. They are under pressure. Make no mistake. They've had a huge increase in uh, mental health alerts. They've had a massive increase in family harm incidents that they, um, that they have to get involved in. That stretches them, and they have to prioritise. And when you start prioritising, it means that they're not always getting to the jobs that they want to get to. So I'm, not, I'm hearing what you're saying. Um, I'm just trying to put some balance around it for you in terms of what the police are actually trying to uh, deal with and stay on top of at the moment. My goal is to try and free them up, as I was saying, so that when you put your hand up to help, you will get a police officer to turn up. Are they lazy? No, I don't think they're lazy. It's not my experience. I've been out on night shift. I go around the country. I see them working in enormous hours. I see them accruing massive amounts of toil. I see the young police officers that we've got dealing with really complicated cases with mental health people, with violent people. They're very nuanced and clever in the way they deal with these things now. I'm hugely impressed. With our police force. We have got a world class police force. So I've been all around the world and I've worked with lots of different law enforcement agencies. We should be very proud of our police. Thank you. Mark, you're here in a very bad situation, obviously. Um, now, you're right about, it doesn't matter where the police stations are because you're right in the need most there too. I mean, I, I used to train undercovers yeah, in, in my previous career. Yeah, years and years ago. Um, but there's a common thread that I found looking after these guys after they got out of the undercover unit that their superiors weren't listening to the intel that they were giving them. Yeah. It was 
was watered down to the PR exercise. And I've got a very good PR background because I used to run radio units on the paper. Background is John Beggs, a former police minister at Radio Pacific. But in, when I got out of that group and Stephen was just on the next, and I started working with the Royal Commission. We did the Lake House report on how the kids' abuse at Lake House wasn't investigated. Um, that, got, that led me to the gang that was coming to see me and asked me, well, do you want to talk to the Royal Commission and the police? I emailed um, Chris at that time, the Deputy Minister. He didn't want anything to do with him at all. They were warning me about the method of meth could turn into fentanyl. Fentanyl was coming here. Um, yeah. But I had all this intel, I give it to the police, and they just, we don't want to know about it. Um, I told them about kids doing car thefts in Wellington 10 years ago, the girls that were in town were really stealing cars, they are beating up police officers. I had to get George Block to do that story regarding police do not report the crimes of kids in a ring of And we've got a whole raft of them coming through. And you know, because we had this chat at the Rising Church about who, what my daughter saw in a ring of Tamarigi facility. And you're right, we have to get all these units, but is it, is it possible to get all these government units to actually work together on a bigger picture? Because they don't listen. Everything's politicised nowadays. Well, I think you, you mentioned they were in Tamariki, so let me give you an example. That, um, the police, uh, with, with these um, violent recidivist youth um, offenders, that are responsible for a large proportion of these of, the, of our retail crime. Um, I asked the police for a report, a bit of detail on that. Police are actually identifying them, they're arresting them, they're charging them, they're opposing bail. Where do you think they're ending back up? Out on the street again. So, so we, so, so, so there's been some, some really direct conversations with Owen and Tupper, if you can say, start supporting the police. We've got to take these um, serious recidivist youth offenders off the street. Number one, the community is immediately safer. Number two, they're safer because they're just making bad decisions. Um, and number three, it then gives us a much better controlled environment to start facing them, stop them from coming into the uh, paddock of the justice system. So, yes, to answer your question, there's a lot more work, a lot more joined up work with ministries and agencies getting out of their silos, talking to each other, working with one another. Fundamentally, it's what we call social investment which is the cornerstone of my belief, the cornerstone of the National Party's belief, and that is identifying where people need help much earlier on and investing them in there. Because especially with kids, you make that investment much earlier on, they can actually realise the potential and take advantage of the opportunities that our country offers, rather than end up in a fast track into the youth justice um, system and straight into the adult system, which they're much harder to rehabilitate and get back on track. Yeah, it is a really good point. Hi, my name is Yuri. Um, I'm actually a business owner, um, very much in this country for about 13 years, just just 10 steps away from the corner. Um, well, the business thing is Sunday blessing event is actually going very every week Sunday. Um, so honestly, the business owner like we want a customer not surrounded by homeless people. Sunday, 
Yeah. Who, who, run, who runs it? Who? No idea. But we've been addressed the issues for years, and no one actually listened. And uh, we've been, we've been like, the bit is tough, but I mean, it's getting really worse. Okay, well, let's, let's, this is the first time I'm aware of it. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely have a talk with um, Sam Boyd about that. Yeah. Um, so they can find, I, I agree with you, is that um, it's got to be somewhere that's, um, that's suitable for them, um, but it's also got to be somewhere that's not interrupting, um, you know, business owners trying to get up I mean, we can help the people, sure. <coughs> but however, probably we can away from the city. Um, there are some discussions on the way. Yeah. There are, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 Um, the crime in our street has been a complete and utter disaster, particularly under um, laser. Um, however, in the last six months, I've been very encouraged by our uh, national and thanks to the national the work that we've done put on. And we're, we're now starting to see the, the tide uh, turn finally. And we're finally been just sort of after two years of being ignored, um, essentially. But my question is um, a lot of the um, anti-social behaviour has been driven by um, people in the CBD who have got um, mental health issues. So for example, we had a schizophrenic who was living opposite in the apartment opposite um, in our property, who in a home or um, uh, uh, an apartment, wreaked, that one person wreaked absolute havoc um, in the street. But it's like, where, you, where do they go? There doesn't seem to be any proper care facility for these people, right there it was, you know, 20, 30 years ago, we had Carrington's, Lake Alice, but it seems to me that people with mental health issues, they're causing, I reckon, probably about 80% of the problems out on the street, that's on the dance. And it seems they you know, get arrested, they back out on the street, and they're causing exactly the same problem again. And I think, okay, right, well, we can tell you who those people are, but there just doesn't seem to be, and I, I you know, the place must be so frustrated with that, where there's no way to take this people. So my question is, what is the government doing about it? Like long term? Um, yeah, so really the point, and I agree with you, is that we're under enormous pressure in this country and we want to have um, a proper response to people with mental health issues. Um, it's an issue that's grown so much, so uh, do we have capacity right now? This is in no way. Uh, are we trying to rebuild it? Yes, we are. Uh, without a doubt, that will take time. It is going to take time. And, and until then, sadly, it's just going to continue to be reactionary. Trying to find something to place on. It's never, probably never the perfect, um, probably never the perfect result for us. Uh, but, you know, we've got a big job ahead of us to try to rebuild a professional mental health labor force, um, then expand the capacity around um, being able to care for people. Uh, I mean, there are great organisations that, you know, private, private NGOs and, and others that are doing work out of the community, but um, it's just not enough. It's reality. And, and often what happens is the police end up having to pick up the slack. And again, doing the job that they shouldn't be doing. Uh, it's, it stretches them again so they're not able to respond to their, uh, what, what they're calling on. Yes, ma'am.
around the mental health response. Yes. Because so, those resources don't exist. No. Within so, so, very, very good question, and I don't, let me, I'm glad you asked that question because I just want to uh, preface what I was saying around my preference is to try and withdraw police out of mental health products where they're not required when you need a health call out. We're not just going to immediately withdraw. There's going to be an intelligent approach to it, and police will withdraw when there's a proper service that stood up and is able to meet the need of that person. So, we are about to start a trial. Uh, through regional hospitals where there's going to be a, um, a, a peer support person that will be put into the BDs and it will allow the police to do a seamless handover takeover with a peer support person that can care for that person and allow the police, free the police up to get back out um, on the road. So we're going to start trialling um, things like that. I'd, I'd prefer not to do a trial, I'd prefer just roll it out because I think it will be very successful. Um, Matt Lucy, who's our mental health minister, big job in rebuilding our uh, workforce. Uh, and we work very closely together to start to identify ways that we can get a health response stepped up instead of a police response. But you know, it's a long, this, this, this is five years. It's a, it's a long piece of work because you've identified the issue and that is starting to re rebuild a professionalised work service to be able to do that work. But police are not immediately excellent. Uh, they'll continue to do the work until we've got the solution to, uh, to take over. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. My name is Shelley Jones. I live in a building downtown which has been the reluctant host to now two rather large and enduring um, encampments of rough sleepers. Um, this particular spot is at the corner of Queen and Key Street. It is in what is known as now Te Kumiti Tunga, the old Queen Elizabeth Square. It is therefore uh, providing a welcome to the many visitors from cruise ships to our city, uh, which has been of some concern to um, the heart of the city, etc. So these encampments have had up to eight or ten people with their bedding, trolleys, umbrellas, barbecues, drug paraphernalia, um, all the accoutrements you need to live a decent life on the street. <coughs> I will say that um, the second group and the first group have been persuaded to take up housing options through the very commendable efforts of Council's Homelessness Outreach Team working with their community partners. Um, police have attended frequently and again commendably Council's um, compliance team uh, worked very hard to persuade the last group to move on. Now you've talked quite a deal about partnership, joined up approaches, a long term uh, approach needed for, for what we've been talking about. I'd like to ask you what you see as the root causes of people preferring to live on the street and how this government will be addressing those root causes and also addressing the reasons that people need professional <coughs> investment that you've spoken of that keeps them out of trouble earlier rather than later. Thank you. Yeah, really good question. I think that the types of people that are really rough sleeping and um, due, a lot of them choose to live out on the streets. They actually have places they can go to. Um, I personally, I mean, it's, it's a very sort of broad brush, brush, but I think that you probably find that there's some sort of addiction problem sitting in there or, uh, or mental health issues, and, um, and they're just choosing to um, come out and have rough sleep. There's some, of course, that there that have no alternatives and have nowhere to go, but you'd be surprised that actually quite a few of them do have alternatives and actual places to go. So it is a difficult and complex issue to, to deal with, but we have to deal with that. Um, in terms of what I was talking around prevention, it's quite simply what we, the term that we use is social investment, and it's about at a central government level using data really to inform decisions to say um, how do we get into people's lives earlier to make the investment to support them, to stay alongside them for as long as we need to, to allow them to actually start to reach their potential, make good decisions in their lives, start to aim for and, and take some of the opportunities that our country offers. And instead of going down that track, 
making bad decisions uh, into our criminal justice system. And then once they're there, much harder to rehabilitate and get them to um, come back in, in regional society. And I'm asking about what you see as being the root causes of those problems. Thank well, you. I, I, I think that, um, me personally, this is just me, Mark Mitchell speaking, my own personal view, I think that um, our social fabric's been ripped uh, without a doubt the ends. I think that a lot of the societal issues and the issues that I see that police deal with come back to um, dysfunctional families, uh, very poor um, parenting, uh, lack of personal responsibility. Uh, and I think that that's what's driving. Uh, we've, we created a very abyssal environment for criminals and organised crime groups to operate in. And um, they felt like they were above the law and they were operating with impunity. And I think that that has leached into these, <coughs> leached into these boy races and the way when you see the way they behave um, towards communities and, and the police. Um, and I think that you know, and, you know young people are like, going to die of um, social media and violence. Um, you know, the, the young offenders that are out doing the retail crime, they're posting and going the other group to go out and do it bigger and, and more spectacular. So there's a whole lot of social issues that are sort of sitting in there that's driving a lot of the issues that as a society we have to deal with. Do you think poverty drives any of this? Do I think? Poverty drives <coughs> any of this. Well, I, think, I think that poverty um, definitely, without a doubt, uh, drives um, some of that behaviour. Um, but, you know, I don't know of. The, the example that I use is that at the end of the day, I'll always believe in personal responsibility. Right? It doesn't matter what life throws at you. Uh, everyone has a tough time. We acknowledge that some people um, are, are born into a, a very dysfunctional uh, family or environment. I, I get all of that. Um, but I can tell you that I've seen some of our best SAS soldiers that come from exactly the same family and have a brother that's in the gang. So one's made good decisions in their life and the other has chosen to make bad decisions. But I think we should never ever step away from that uh, element of personal responsibility.
go to the lighter, go to when you water to come and the Queen Street, the safest thing for me to do is drive. I'm not going to take the public transport for that. And the safest place for me to go is to park in the downtown car park building because it's incredibly safe. And that's just been sold. So I want to hear that the National Party are going to support the judicial review of the selling of the downtown car park building that broke the law, it broke the local government act. We need to get control of our city back again and get the people in. Look at your photos of the 1950s and 1960s where there were masses of people, masses of cars, masses of trams, buses, whatever transport, there was the farmer's free bus. It all worked. We've destroyed all of that. And what needs to happen, in my opinion, is that the government needs to look at the formation of the Super City and not if I will be the first to tell you that he's made a lot of mistakes in that. Turn those mistakes around, give the GST that has been paid on rates back to the, to the council so that they can actually do the things that are needed to get the city to turn around. <laughs> really good points and you wouldn't get any argument <laughs> my electorate is right up north right so you would get no argument from our people my people up there uh, without a doubt around the reorganization of local government arrangements but that is not my portfolio that is um city and browns well and, uh, you're in government so so work together you just said at the beginning of this that all the departments need to work together and that's the first thing no, no, we, we, are, we, we are working to get them back to us. We, we are working together, but I can assure you that um, although you've made some very good points, I don't think there's going to be any plans or any appetite to go through a massive reorganisation of our local government. We don't have to be huge. But I do, but I, but I, but I do agree with you. I, I do agree with you about accountability and about organisations being held to account publicly. I agree with you completely on that. You get no argument from me at all. My job, quite simply at the moment, what I'm focused on, and I agree with you, that we all remember, I remember Auckland being a buzzy, vibrant, um, it was the heart. We used to come in from um, North Shore and, and, and up north, and uh, th th it was an exciting uh, trip, you know, day trip to come into the city. Uh, I, I remember when I, was, when, I was, when I was policing here, Back in the 90s, it was an exciting, vibrant place. It was um, the place was always um, buzzing. So that's what we want to get back to. My job is to start to get on top of the trial. And my job is to tell you that you could do a piece and you change the location. Yeah, I, I, I don't agree with you in terms of crime. I'm actually police. One observation, Kerry, resident of the Queen's Bay, the young. I'm sorry, I'm concerned about the culture in the police force. This gentleman over here, I think, he's an addict. This conversation here has been replicated. It's being replicated throughout the country. I mean, everything spoken about here is not new. We could have determined beforehand what we were going to talk about. Why is it that the national government, per se, given your crime um, policy to one, why do you have to convince the police, for example, to put the cops on the beat back in Auckland? When they've got all the data, they know all the fiction ones, they see the profile of crime, uh, uh, it can be solved by putting police on the beat. Yeah. Do that? No, let's not do that. Why is it? The last little while, probably, the crime rate's been soaring. It's not just the last six years, it's accelerated, certainly. Prior to that, the trends were obvious. The solutions were obvious. Why do they need you to come back in and convince them to do what is obvious and right? What is it in that culture of the New Zealand police force, who might support it totally, that prevents them? from doing what needs to be done. It's not resource, it's attitude. Well I agree with you. I mean see, I think that um, I think that you get a you get a police service that serves the government of the day. And the government of the day will have different priorities. Please. And, and, you, and I'm sorry, but you had a you had a Labour government that had very different priorities. Their priorities were to reduce the prison 
um, uh, muster by 30%, then go for alternative actions, i.e. slap on the wrist of the wet bus ticket. But the legally, um, the police and, and exercise at the degree of independence. Yes, they do. In the parliamentary yes, system. Yes, they, they, yes, they do. And, and, and Why haven't they and exercised that, and that is a very good question, and I agree with you, is that the Commissioner exercises and has operational independence. Very important. So he will decide um, on prosecution, or the police will decide on prosecution decisions, and will decide on where they put their resources and how they use their resources. So he could not have his head and say, yes, Minister. But I, I get to decide I but I get, I get to decide what our government's priorities are, along with the Prime Minister and the Cabinet Vice Chairman. And we've been very clear what our priorities are. We're investing $1.9 billion in the corrections because we're going to build our white area. Why? Because we're prioritising public safety. Yeah. And we're going to put people into prison and try to rehabilitate them. We're also putting $78 million into additional rehabilitation programs to prisons on demand, first time ever. But what's our priority? Public safety. And you're holding this, sorry, the Commissioner, accountable <laughs> yes. for results. Yes. I think you're telling you that I hold it accountable. The results have got too very Absolutely. Much. Well, like, like I said in my opening statement, we've been in six months. Why have the CBD started to trend down? No, no, I'm talking about previous trends. This is not true. Well, in an organisation, if you've got a situation where it's constant failure and the key performance indicator is going backwards, yep. you tend to do something about who it is that's leading and organising your I, I hear what you're saying, I believe. <laughs> I hear, I hear and it's not just please. Yeah. Hold them accountable. Yeah, I, I'm with you 110%. That's true. I think we're going to have one question over here. Then is there appetite for more questions? Or since we are running slightly over time now, would you like to continue with the QA? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Excellent. So, we'll start over here. Thank you. Um, I think the current tonight, my name is Murray Crane. I'm a senior hey, IPA retail veteran in the high street and surrounding. Area, so I've definitely seen a lot of changes, and unfortunately, progress brings its problems with it, which is what I think everyone is referring to tonight. And I've been here long enough to know that there's probably been about eight drug dealers have gone on and tried to screw in the time we've been standing here. <laughs> so I wanted to go back to one of your earlier points around the video and around using technology. Uh, is there any appetite, or has there been any research done into what parts of the CBD are not covered by CCTV? And is there anything being done with regard to that? Look, that, that is very operational. I don't know where the black spots are um, in the CBD. Um, it's not my, you know, good. Yeah, if I could speak to that, yeah. Uh, Murray, we've just done a piece of work. Do you want this one? Oh. We've actually just done a piece of work to identify some of the parts. Some gaps and actually just built work. Oh, yeah. oh no, we've just gone through an exercise actually with police locally, identified some gaps and purchased some extra um, CCTV. And I can say the coverage is extensive, uh, and the police were very happy to have the extra ones. Um, it's still not a camera in the high street. Sorry. I mean, we installed our own cameras two years ago due to the lack of cameras in the high street. And we've probably been approached by police at least once every two weeks. Okay, look, I can talk offline about that. I mean, we took advice from police and we've bought some yeah. extra cameras. So we can, if you think there's still some gaps, you know, we won't fill them. Um, but we, we, the feedback we had from police is that that's a pretty good coverage now. Okay. Yeah, that's our, our area. But I mean, AT does have, have a, uh, some their transport system monitors. Is going on every day for CBD. And we've got to say no to it. 
the hopeless people out there are trading drugs. I've seen them myself. They came into the arcade, they're trading drugs. They're coming back, many of them sleeping in very nice apartments, are eating quite nice salaries, not all of them, some of them, um, from their begging, from their drug trading, and many of them are offensive. They've okay, been assaulted, they've been abused, intimidated, um, and it's a, it's a daily occurrence. What I want to ask is through you, Mark, back to the states and the councillors here today, is a bylaw under the, the public safety and nuisance bylaws that people aren't allowed to intimidate, address, receive, and other things, and are not being enforced. Um, the council compliance guys say that we can't do anything to say, gee, you go to AT and they say, we can't do anything. Um, it's more from the council, police can't do anything. So the guys and the girls lie on the street, they're like slobs, they smell. It's, it's a terrible state and it's terrible. Our yeah, second day there is in a state of crisis that we've got to fix, we've got to say no. And even if that fire was a force that would make a difference. So why isn't that fire going to make a difference? So, that's great feedback. Did you just email me the scene? I've got your email, I was reading it on the, uh, on the way in, so it's very good. Um, I gave you the footage of the incident. Oh, it's footage here as well? Yeah. Okay, great. You said, no, I did, I saw the footage. Yeah, the, the four people seen in the, uh, yeah. So, um, look, really good uh, read, and, and, and basically the stakeholders meeting that I'm pulling together. One of the big things is who's got ownership? Who's taking ownership of it? Because it is too easy to push it off, and push it around, and not actually deal with the issue. Uh, what for us sleepers, big issue for police. Uh, you know, they want that dealt to and they want that sorted out as well. We want to get the homeless off the streets. And by the way, I agree with you completely. There's people out there that aren't homeless that are just quite simply using it as ability to um, to uh, pass a deal of drugs without doubt. Can I just say that uh, for those of you here, um, Roland and I presented to council the Department of Public They've got to get into enforcement mode and it's hard, it's crunchy, you've just got to be focused, you've got to have the intestinal fortitude to just keep enforcing, keep enforcing. Um, and and that, that's how you start to affect change, it doesn't happen overnight. Who enforces? Well, it's the council. It's the council violence. Police can't do it. No, it doesn't. No, that, that, that part of the council lines. Yeah, yeah. Can I just make a comment? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
and the game system is pretty simple. Through the statistics and research we have done over eight years, 80% of the game population are OG children, state children. 80% of the people in the prisons are those people from the games from state care. Our state care is not protecting the children, they are harming the children. And yet Anne Tony herself said that the, the likelihood of putting a child into <coughs> care had a massive 60% chance of having damage for abuse, sexual or any sort of damage, while as opposed to 3% in their family or parental care. The issue here is that we've got good parents being penalised for trying to raise their children to have morals and respect of society. And then we have families that are being damaged and hurt from this, which then leads to your mental health crisis. A huge amount of the people in the mental health crisis problems are actually damaged families suffering from trauma from what has happened to them with no accountability from any department whether it be the police, the judicial department, or the government, I myself have my case approaching the UN like they tell us. It is unbelievable that people have to go to this extreme. I myself shouldn't have had to found a company, a charity, to help people with these problems that the government and the public servants should be doing. People should be aware that the police, OT, and other departments have memorandums of understanding that does not serve the public. It serves their interests for their KPIs and their pecuniary gains that they make out of the children. The Waitangi investigations show that a thousand children a year disappear out of New Zealand and off the system as if they were never born. There's no paperwork, they don't exist. Where is the accountability for these missing children and what's happening to them? Because we've got a society here that's, we're not going down the, the drain, we're gone. We're way past going down the drain. This country is a shambles. People don't want to come here. Governments <coughs> tell people that it's the worst experience they've ever had. I mean, you see it all the time in the papers. Yeah, there's a lot of times, there's a lot of times, actually, what, what, without a doubt, we've got some challenges, but let, rest assured, you look around the world, I just been in Australia three weeks ago meeting with the state and the federal police ministers there, big challenges as well. We're still a beautiful country, we should still be optimistic, and we should still be looking forward. Yeah. We, we're, go, we're going through a tough, we're going through a tough time, but we're going through a tough economic time, uh, but we will come through that, and uh, we'll move stronger, and we'll keep going again. There's no doubt about that. The issues that you're raising, I agree with you. The state is not the right, it's not designed, it's not there to raise kids. Um, families, parents should be caring and raising kids, but the reality is this, is there's parents out there that don't look after their kids. I agree. And we're still, there's parents out there that don't kids. <coughs> Um, and so when that happens, there has to be a response from the government. And, um, and, and, and that's what happens. Penalising decent parents or loving parents is not the only trying to raise their children morally or financial gains is a problem because it's happening in this issue. Well, decent, decent parents, um, decent parents trying to raise their children should never be targeted. Um, and if they are, you've got examples of that. Yes, Please I, have, I have a police document that shows police corruption of changing the police. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and we, we, I want to make sure that you have control. It has some time to chat. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah. Well, just go ahead. Just go ahead. Those two last two questions. Yeah, thanks, Minister. Just one question. Uh, it's belief, it's big police yourself. What do you envisage for the situation that we currently have, I'm a 10 year resident in the CBD, the situation we currently have in the CBD is adequate beat police yeah. in downtown CBD. And I'm not talking about police driving around in police cars or paddy wagons, I'm talking leather on the pavement. No, absolutely, look, that's, and that's what I want. And, 
there has been a, uh, a 58% increase in foot patrols in the CBD. No, no there hasn't. Whereas, that's rubbish. Sorry. Yeah, that is rubbish. No, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. But if you're going to stand up and you're going to start your comment with that's rubbish, then we probably haven't got a lot to say. Well, we have, sir, because I've been, I've had the mic for like 30 minutes and I've listened to, and I was one of the last two. I'm British, I've lived here for 25 years, okay? I have a sling on my arm because on Friday I went to Chemist Warehouse to get something, and as I went in, the police were there because they'd just been ram raided. So I left, I walked up to Countdown. While I was at uh, Victoria Street, while I was in Countdown, Somebody grabbed a load of those and went out, and the security and the staff couldn't hold them, and I helped to hold them, and then they got the liquor off them, and the person ran. I then went to Look Sharp to buy bin bags. I, I'm, I, doesn't matter why. I got the bin bags, I put my backpack, I put the, the, my backpack down to load the bin bags, and I heard the staff in there shouting, and the person ran in, and I know this because I have the video footage on my phone, ran in, grabbed a load of stuff and ran out and I tried to stop them and went down hard. I'd had an operation on my left shoulder, the right shoulder got dislocated, banged up, bruised, yada, yada, yada. I've lived in, in Auckland for 25 years, I've been downtown for the last three years and I can count on one hand how many times I've actually seen police on a beat Walking up and down Queen Street, or okay, Cabo. Yeah, yeah. And I, I work overseas in the cruise industry, actually, and I've been to New York, Seattle, um, Sydney, and every street you're on, even if there's no police, they park a police car so that other people know there are police in the area because there's a police car there. But I've only seen it once or twice here. And secondly, get rid of the people begging for pennies on Queen Street. The law overseas is no soliciting. They all live. They, they are all given somewhere to live. But while they haven't got a job, they come out and beg all day. In the cruise ships, they pull in. People come out across the bottom of Key Street. And there's all the homeless people sitting there. Hand up. Is that the first view of Auckland you want, or New Zealand you want to have to do. It isn't Auckland, it isn't finished, but it's pretty bloody close. I've lived here for, for 25 years. You've only been in, in power six months, and thank God you're in power after the last six years. I'm sick, sick of hearing big time when a 13-year-old is held up court doing a, a ram raid you do an adult crime, you get adult punishment. Simple as that. <laughs> I do appreciate what you're trying to do, but this whole, well, they're only 13, they've had a tough upbringing. We all had tough upbringings. Well, you're not hearing that from me. You're not, you're oh, no, no, so, I, I'm yeah. not saying you, sir, I'm not yeah. saying you, but this whole, get stop the soliciting on Queen Street. I've tried to approach council, oh no, if we give them, they're, they're not interested. When you get 30-something people begging on Queen Street every day, rotating around, changing spots, who the hell wants to walk up Queen Street? All the, uh, li literally, in the last 10 years, the amount of cruises, they used to go from Sydney to Auckland, finish, all the passengers get off, all the passengers get on, they go back to Sydney. Now, 75% of them go in and out of Sydney because nobody wants to get off in Auckland and have two days here to spend because it isn't safe. It isn't safe. It's embarrassing for us as a country, and that was what I alluded to in my like comments saying that you measure a country safety, how safe a country is by the major city, right? Yes. All around this street. You've articulated perfectly what the issues are. I'm not diminishing those, I agree with you. We've got to tackle them. The bit that I don't agree with you is that you said rubbish to the, to the um, increase in foot patrols. I've been pushing that very, very hard. I've been out on a night shift myself with the staff so that I can see with my own eyes that there is change happening. And there is change happening. And like I said to you, we have stuff, we are seeing to see things move in the right direction. I'm not saying that we've hit the panacea or the silver bullet or that we're there. We're not. It's a marathon. And we've only just started this. Um, 
but I'm committed to make sure that I can come back in 12 months and you can stand up and you haven't had to deal with all that, um, with, with the awful um, crime that you've just outlaid all, you know, all of us tonight. Is that um, the increase of 1% for the Sorry? Is that 58% increase of 1% for the cost of 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 the in the last six months. So, so since we've covered the government, it's just fiction. Has, has, has anyone in this room seen a visible increase in the No! when I tried to attack, stop this person, not attack, stop this person <laughs> running out, but I went, hang on, I went down on the stone steps, we called, they called an ambulance for me, after 45 minutes, in the centre of Auckland, after 45 minutes I got an Uber to the hospital, because that's how long it had taken, and they said, we can't get to you, get an Uber, we are not living in some dystopian, oh, but yes, the patrols are better. We don't want people in green fluoro vests. We want cops. They should. No, we don't. We don't. They do. I want to see two cops, one side going up, two cops coming down, just rotating all day. So we see the We're definitely working towards increasing more and more. We're not stopping 58. Because I was in Brisbane recently, and um, with Sarah, who we were on date night tonight, by the way. Um, I, was, I thought I might get a question, but I haven't. Um, we're, in, we're in Brisbane, and the thing that we noticed as we went down to South Bank is that we saw three or four um, foot patrols, the police. Right? They have a, there's a presence there. The public like it, gives them a sense of security, and, um, and they're there to deal with something if something comes up. It's less likely to be disorder or bad behaviour because they know that the police are going to be coming through on a regular basis. That's what I'm trying to move towards. Uh, why, why can't we have a police station in town somewhere or a branded police station? Well, it's asked that. Like we, we are, are yeah. So the police are working, trying to do, they'll work with a private, uh, public partnership to try and get a uh, patrol base or something down at uh, the bottom of town. We don't have the funding for it or the money to open up a, um, a purpose-built police station. But um, I certainly support and think that um, you know, having a visible presence, other than police down on the beat, down there would be uh, a good thing. Somebody yeah. asked earlier, wasn't um, answered, uh, it's up, it's the, the street patrol was up 50 percent but what is that up from? Yeah, well, that's, so that's whatever they were doing when we came into, um, to, came into government, so whatever they were doing in terms of their foot patrols, They'll increase that by 58%. 58% zeros. <laughs> well, they, yeah, well, well, they were doing, they did have big officers, they did have big patrols uh, that were happening before we came into government. But I think it's very clear that I want to see a big increase in police being highly visible back down on the beat. Um, that is starting to happen, and I'm, I'm very thankful that, thank you for standing up and acknowledging that, because a lot of the feedback that I get, whether it's third or I had the, um, I had the uh, chief executive of the Newmarket uh, Business Association with me down in Wellington last week. He said it's very visible, and they've had a 10 percent reduction in, uh, in crime. So, uh, that, so that is happening, and uh, I just want to see it continue to increase. Yeah. Just a uh, comment by Alvin is that we see a lot more police presence in K-World. 
Then Alice tried to protect our own. We put our um, CCTV camera on our townhouse. We would put this, you name it, everything from drug dealing to um, people urinating on our front doorstep and social behavior, you name it, it's, it's all on there. So we are capturing more police in the street. But the thing is, they're driving past, yeah. they're not actually on <coughs> foot patrol, and they're actually going past crime. Like on Saturday, we had a security company. This guy got out, parked out in front of our place, got out, urinated right in front of our front office, and the police rode past. But they didn't see it, they missed it. Yeah, so well, I think foot patrols are very important because driving past is not enough. Yeah, well, I'm a huge believer in, um, in being patrol. That's, that's how you learn your craft, that's how you learn how to communicate, uh, that's, learn, that's your basis in policing. And, and what the CI spent two years, and we've, we've gone away from that completely, and we're going back to it. Uh, so ladies, sorry, ladies and gentlemen, we, the night is carrying on, it's getting a little bit late. Uh, we, we do want to uh, close the evening and pass the mic to the community patrol. who have been doing a fantastic job. Just before that, uh, I have to say, it, last year during the campaign, Mark, you were incredibly supportive. It was heartbreaking, like hearing all the stories, staring on those people, and it's heartbreaking right now, it's heartbreaking listening to all the stories right now. But it also gives me and I presume all of you hope that there's a group of people, it's a reflection of our society and all the sense of coming together, voicing, expressing, coming up with ideas, and I hope you feel incredibly heard by someone who's saying, yeah, we hear you. So I, I hope that gives us a lot of hope and also want to acknowledge further representation from the National Party uh, MP Dr. Carlos Chong, who's here from Mount Ross Thank you, as well. So I'd like to pass the mic to Community Patrol, who do a fantastic job. They, they, um, they, they, we have raised some money for our way. We intend to raise some more money for an extra car. They also need more recruitment, more people. So, uh, Chris, you can share with us.